classical definition of information operations. It's the integrated employment uh, during military operations, and this is not just about military operations, of information related to capabilities in concert with other lines of operations. And other lines of operations here are military deception, psychological operations, computer network attacks, computer network defense. So it's a variety of things that go into information operations. Uh, to influence, disrupt, corrupt, and you know the decision making of adversaries and potential adversaries. This is very important because what we're going to be talking about is how nation states use cyberspace and other things to actually try to influence another country. And that could either be they're trying to influence it for political means, they're trying to um, use some type of thing to actually overthrow a government, or they're also trying to change the shape of some geopolitical thing. So oil, um, EU uh, type uh, commitments, they're, they're, that's what they try to do here. So who does information operations? Well, everyone, does everyone know who SWAG this is? This is Russia. So Russia's been in the news nonstop ever since the elections, and that's just been going on. Russia's not the only one that does this. I mean, we have Germany, we have Britain, China, Israel, France, Estonia, and the Ukraine. All these countries pretty much around the world use some type of information operations to do things. If we look at these countries, you know, Israel here does infor information operations against the Palest Palestinians, Hamas. If you go out to their YouTube channel, you'll see constantly in YouTube channels where they're doing counter-propaganda. So when you get someone from Hamas put something out, the Israelis will put a counterpiece out, and it goes back and forth on this. Same way with Estonia. Estonia became the poster child for cyber warfare in 2007 because they moved a Soviet monument uh, from downtown onto the NATO base. And when they went to move that monument, someone, Russia, actually launched a cyber attack against Estonia that lasted 10 days, and if you've never been to Estonia, Estonia is the most wired country you can ever go to. It is a little bitty podunk country. 1.6 million people live there. Skype was invented there in Tallinn. And, but they don't use cash. They don't have checks. The banks don't issue checks. They only use debit cards. Their cell phone network, when you go to park a car on the streets, you just have to take your phone out and hit a button. And that car is paid for wherever you're parking it, and it'll actually debit your account. God, I wish that was in America. When you go to get your cell phone from your service provider, it gets two forms of identity, two digital certificates, medium grade and high grade. They use, their, they use these digital identities for voting. They use it for all their medical transactions, taxes, anything is with a digital ID that's put on their phone. And they also get digital ID cards. So when this cyber attack occurred for 10 days, Estonia was turned upside down because no one could actually do anything. Because no one had cash. They couldn't, you know, get their medical records. They, it was just chaos there. And, and, but it didn't have like what happened later in Georgia. It didn't have that, that same appeal. But that's what happened here. Sure. Yeah. Why did Russia attack? Russia attacked because they, they moved that Soviet war memorial. So it was during World War II. Can you repeat the question? So she was asking about Finland, you know, that what well, she was asking about um, Russia used to be, I mean, Estonia used to be a satellite republic, you know, part of the, there until 1993, until it, you know, everyone, it, it fell apart, the Soviet Union. And then she was talking about Finland, buying stuff from Finland. 
But the actual attack, when it took place, it, it really hit the core. If you know about the attack, so Estonia did not secure their systems correctly according to CERT's guidelines from 1999, and this was 2007. And those guidelines say you should turn off ping, ICMP, on your core routers. And they did not turn it off. So it was a large-scale ping attack against all their core systems. And the, that ping attack was mostly from botnets. A lot of those botnets or the systems were in the United States. And so it just overflooded that system, and they couldn't turn it off. And it just went on for 10 days. So those are some of the... There. Okay, so let's. we're going to move to Georgia. I just told you about Estonia. So in Georgia... In 2008, in the summer, it was in August, there was a, a cyber attack. The first cyber attack there actually took place in June, July. And that cyber attack was when the separatists that were in South Ossetia, this is before the Soviet Union or the Russia actually came into Georgia and crossed the, across the border. So in July, the separatists were meeting with the, with the, with the EU trying to work out a, a, an agreement. And as soon as the separatists walked out of this agreement, uh, they didn't sign it. As soon as they walked out, a cyber attack took place on the country, uh, mostly the president's website, and went on. As soon as the separatist leader came back into the talks, the cyber attack stopped. Is it a coincidence that this attack occurred? You know, probably not. But so, flat, you know, go forward a little bit here, Less than a month later, the, so the Russians came across the border to the south of Cincinnati. And if you know about Georgia and geopolitics here, Georgia is on the Caspian Sea. Georgia used to be part of the Soviet Union when it was there. Russia actually stole that from Iran back in the 1940s uh, after World War II. They were able to take that piece of property over. But in 2005 and before, what happened was the British Petroleum, funded with the United States money, built a pipeline called the BTC Pipeline that actually became operational and started moving oil out of the Caspian Sea. And this is significant because Russia gets a lot of their oil out of the Caspian Sea and natural gas, and then they pipe it into Russia, and then they pipe it through Ukraine into the in, into Europe. And so when this pipeline went operational, it actually caused problems for the Soviet Union. So, so, so what happened was, in 2006, they, is, they tried to actually overthrow the government in 2006. Most people don't remember this, but in 2006 they did. So then in 2008, in August, the first thing that happened was the president's website and the parliament website um, was attacked, and this image was put out there, and you see the difference between the president of Georgia and Hitler, right? So you look at this, and how hard would you think that, this was in 2008, okay? How hard would you think this would be put together? To go out and find these images that match up exactly with Hitler. It's not easy, right? It's not easy to put together. But, so, if you know about me, I'm, my claim to fame was I did a big paper on this. But the key to this image, whenever you're doing forensics, try to find the original image for some type of defacement. Because the, what the key for this was, notice the date when this image was actually created. 2006, when they tried to overthrow the government before, this image was not used it was created in 2006 when they were first trying to overthrow the government, but it was used in 2008. So this was significant because it showed that Russia at the time had pre-planned operations against Georgia for years. And, and they planned this stuff and then launched the attacks. Notice the Nazi thing here. Again, you know, during World War II, the Soviet Union fought on the side of us, you know, the United States, Britain, and everyone else. Eventually. What's that? Eventually. 
Eventually, yes, they did, eventually. But they lost a lot of people uh, against the Nazis, the Germans at the time. And so they have a central theme going throughout all their campaigns against you know, some of their satellite republics, their former satellite republics, and it's all about Nazism. So when Ukraine was attacked, this was an image that was put on 130 websites. It was, it was I forget the, it was an SQL, I think it was an SQL, no, an Apache problem that caused this. But this was quickly put out there on 100 something sites trying to promote, hey, you know, Ukraine here, you have a problem. You have a bunch of Nazis here, and we're here to help you, right? This is what it's doing. And this is speaking to the ethnicities of Russian nationals that actually live in the country, saying, oh, you're being taken over. Let's see if we can get this to play. Okay. Okay, let me step out of this and play this video real quick. It's not playing there. So this is a video. This is a video. You can't hear it, but. This is a video that was posted online. This is in of Ukraine. And we know about Ukraine because um, the Russians went in and took over Crimea with their little green men, which were mostly Spetsnaz forces. And this video opens about, you know, the peace and stuff in, in Ukraine and some violence that starts taking place. And then now they're signing, you know, the president of the country is signing uh, an accord. He signed it to show the papers in English, not the actual version from there. This is targeted toward uh, English speakers and toward Russians. Now it goes into chaos. And it keeps going. It's, and keep going here. So we still got the chaos. And it's talking about the rescue. Here in a second, there'll be a flash up there. Oh, it's in Russian. And it's like, how, you know, how we're going to save you. You know, and at the end of the video, which is coming up here in a second. So this video here, let me, let me give you some background on this video. Forensically, this video was posted online March 5th, 2014, right? To YouTube. The guy, whoever posted it only posted it one time, never had another account anywhere out on the internet with the same name. And so now it shows like the Russians coming in to save the day, storming across the borders. But March 5th is very interesting because if you know anything about what's gone on in, in geopolitics over the years, Configur, we all remember Configur. Configur, uh, the last update of Configur was on March 5th. Um, it occurred on March 5th uh, from U.S. servers. And this, this group right here that's up here on the, that side, they're the ones who are Russians. That's a Russian group that actually talks about trying to overthrow the country, but portray themselves as Ukrainians. But they're not Ukrainians, they're Russian. And so March 5th, when Config updated itself, and then Stuxnet had a March 5th date. So March 5th plays a very important role in a lot of things because March 5th, you know, there we had a, we had the nuclear agreements were signed around the world, so March fifth plays a big role in a lot of things. But that video was very professionally made. If someone took the time and effort to put that video together within a few days and it posted online one time 
and then it went around the world. So, still about geopolitics here. This is still going into the time frame of Ukraine and Crimea and stuff. If everyone's used this, this is where you go out and front look at the US attacks. And so this attack right here was what took place um, against Belgium, NATO headquarters, and against the CCDU, C, CCDCOE in Estonia. So there was this cyber attack using uh, time, the time protocol, and it knocked out NATO's website for 48 hours. NATO's primary website was down for 48 hours from this attack. The CCDCOE, which is a NATO center for cyber in Estonia, it was down for 10 days. They had to redo the, their entire infrastructure to protect it. This is the NATO center that's supposed to be the cyber center of excellence for you know, cyber warfare, and they were taken offline for 10 days. The significance here is this propaganda was posted, CCDCOE in Estonia, and Estonia and Russia hate each other. And the group that you just saw in the video, here their group, and here is the snake here, and here is a bird of prey that will eat the snake, and this is what this is, the symbolism here, and this is what they're doing. They're throwing it in your face. This is what's going on. Here's another attack that takes place right here on March 1st. Well, this is March 5th, I think. But, no, March 4th. You can actually t look, if you look at some of the geopolitical events, you can actually look in the paper and see what an event takes place in some of these geopolitical events, and you can actually tie a denial of service attack to these events. And they happen within minutes of a newspaper article coming out. So these things are pre-planned and ready to go. Another one in Ukraine, same thing, April 15, 2014, this, you know, put out massive spike in denial of service attack that quick. Same thing, Russia smashing troops on the border, massive attack, huge spike. This is coming out of Russia. Another one also, this is also internal now, this is internal attacks going on. Okay, so here is, significance here is, we're still in Ukraine. And this is still on the information operations. Information operations, remember I told you they also do computer network attacks, propaganda network attacks, psyops, deception, and so forth. So this right here is significant because this is the first attack against the electrical grid that actually took it down. I think it was 700,000 people that were affected by this. And of course they rode through the VPN, they got in and got the credentials, they took the, down the network. The significance of where this actually located was around Christmas, but this is also the same location and near the same day that the Russian party in Ukraine was disbanded. The same time frame, and this attack occurred. Also, this where this place was located is also a choke point for the natural gas systems coming across Ukraine. So this wasn't, this wasn't just like a random event. Someone targeted this, this facility and took it down based on its geolocation. And when they had the second attack later, it was in the southern part of Ukraine. That attack, when it took place, it was also a strategic choke point. It was a very special part of the grid that when, if it would have collapsed totally, it could have actually caused a widespread failure across Ukraine. So these, these events were just not random. They were very targeted events by likely Russian actors. So we're going to talk about election chaos real quick. What time are we get? What time are we over? 12? 1130, okay. Everyone knows about election chaos. I mean, come on, in the last couple of days, 
you know, right here in USA Today when I was flying here, Russia meddles in 27 nations. And he goes through here and talks about Russia and all their meddling. And it starts in 2004 in uh, Lithuania, Soviet Republic, former Soviet Republic, Estonia, Georgia. And then there's like a gap. And you know, there's, there's really not a gap. There's all kinds of stuff that went on from 2008 to 2013. Whoever wrote this article didn't do enough research. But so, this has been widespread news. So the first thing, if we look at the election, we all know that Hillary Clinton lost, right? We all know potentially why. And But the first thing that happened was the DNC was hacked, her emails were compromised, they were put out on WikiLeaks, and then this large-scale campaigns against Hillary Clinton. And it just kept going on. And you, how do you deal with that? And then, the, you know, the server... You know, all these issues went on. And it just caused havoc for Hillary Clinton with these e this email campaign. There was no they really did no counter to, to deal with these e these emails. Who would who would actually from geopolitics here, the reason Russia wanted President Trump in office was because he was potentially the best candidate to create chaos for the United States in our foreign policy decisions in the U.S. So if Russia could get President Trump in office, potentially he could cause enough chaos to have internal problems in the U.S. He could have enough problems, because he's already had issues with NATO already, you know, handing Merkel a $300 million bill in the White House to pay for, you know, NATO. He's, you know, he's made all these problems. Russia has actually increased their influence. They were increasing their influence under President Obama because he didn't have strict policies against Russia. But when Trump came in office, it actually allowed uh, uh, Putin to actually bring Russia up more. So this is what's been going on. This is why Trump actually is president. It's because they wanted him in office because it would help them geopolitically around the world. So some of the fake news sites that came up, um, several of these came up and these came up in November and November and October of 2016. The world politics was November. The USA Radio was November. And the Washington Evening was actually in 2017 in April. So these websites came up. This one right here, when it first came up in November, um, automatically it started putting out propaganda Day one, U.S. intel officers report no link between Russia and Donald Trump. First article they posted. Well, the first article they posted was, really the first article they posted was it said, welcome to WordPress. You know, <laughs> that's what the first article was. Whoever put that out didn't remove the first article that says, welcome to WordPress, but that's what it did. And then the, right after that, next one, Obama's ready to pardon Hillary Clinton. These were directly targeted at, you know, trying to undermine Hillary Clinton further and help Trump. And this site came up, it started being tweeted around, Facebooked around, and stuff. Then we came up, who, who doesn't have a Facebook account? Let's ask that question. Okay. Who doesn't have a fake Facebook account? Okay. Personally, I have plenty of Facebook accounts, right? It's so easy to create a fake Facebook account and use it for whatever you want. My brother runs one for Tom Jones, you know, the singer, and he runs all this junk through it all the time. It'd be very, you know, over the top sometimes. But so this is one of the first accounts that Facebook identified as being bogus, right? Some of the first articles I posted was about war crimes against the U.S. Lake Coalition. You know, civilians and, and stuff. And so it started having issues here. Facebook cannot, you know, police all these accounts that came up. But the significance here, this guy only has 10 people, and this made national news about this guy. He only had 10 people. He only had 10 followers. Most of them were also fake Facebook accounts. And most of his stuff wasn't even, you know, passed on. But this became an issue with this account. 
but it had no really significance of actually influence beyond just a few, a few other accounts. Social media impersonation, same guy, 2016, a website came up a couple of weeks before uh, this was posted, and the website was DC Leaks, of course, again, targeting Hillary Clinton and Trump, you know, supporting Trump, it came up, and this is the one that they, they talk about here, it's, you know, they say it's linked to the Russian GR, GRU, the intelligence group. It's kind of hard to say if it's linked to the GRU because you'd have to be able to actually see the person at the keyboard. Forensics in these accounts is very difficult because if you're like me, you're using VPNs or Tor or something else. So it's really difficult to actually trace some of this stuff back. Twitter bot, bot influence. This was another one. We had more. This was, look, you can tell these are fake accounts. And they're just seconds apart. And this made national news too. Uh, this hashtag here, it was tweeted 1,700 times in like a few minutes. 1,700 times is nothing. It, and when you go and actually look at these accounts, it did nothing to influence the election. These accounts, even though they've been written up in the New York Times and other places, they did not get retweeted. These accounts did not have the influence to retweet stuff. It would be like if you had like you know, Molly Cyrus's account or someone like that, Britney Spears or someone. You know, those accounts with millions of followers, if you tweet something like this on one of those, then it's going to get retweeted. But a random account, no. Yes? But you can influence trending hashtags. Yeah, but this one, this one did not trend high enough to do that. So you can do that, but this did not trend high enough to actually put it at the top of the list all day. Because it was really quick. I'm sure that's what they're after. Yeah, eventually, yeah. But you would have to tweet you you would have to tweet a lot to do that. And you would have to actually have a lot of followers or buy a lot of followers to, to do something like that. But they didn't. Geopolitical cyber attacks again. We had the French president, the you know, French candidate attack. We talked about his sexuality, which is a big thing in Russia. They talk about his sexual orientation. They've done it against a lot of candidates because in Russia it's illegal to be gay. Uh, they'll kill you if they find out in some cases. So they try to make this out to be against these uh, candidates that they're, they're, they're gay. Right here, just the other day, September 3rd, a hacker attack took out the website for this candidate, which is going against Merkel. Merkel's going in for, for her fourth term, potentially. And they, sometimes when, now think about this. This guy was going to be running for candidate, and he won after the attack because he got sympathy. This candidate was just recently attacked. This possibility, they're attacking her to actually increase her in the country. Not degrade her, but increase her you know, acceptance in the country and potentially she'll get elected and Merkel will disappear all because of cyber attacks. Anyone got any questions? Oh, yeah, sure. I've got one. Um, so, when are we going <clears> to <throat> when are we going to turn it around? Uh, Vladimir Putin is very vulnerable not to misinformation but actual real information. You know, he goes on TV and contradicts things that the Russian Statistics Service or the Russian Ministry of Agriculture says. It's not very hard. So, um, when are we going to turn it around and start you know, not doing the same thing to them? But kind of, uh, what, us, us go around and create Twitter storms against him? No, but um, Where are sort you of doing engage that? in the information space to uh, help people who are trying to... Uh, change the government in Russia? Well, the United States, the State Department already has large campaigns already trying to influence politics in those other countries. Are they successful? It's hard to measure. It's, I mean, it's it just like, you know, the influence of all this stuff here. You know, if you look at all the articles, how do you measure what it really did? Because just by looking at the hashtag, you know, if it increased on Twitter, it to be like, you know, for an hour, like a very trending hashtag. What did it do beyond that? You know, who else tweeted it? 
you know, what did they talk about, what did they share, you know, it's, it's really difficult to figure out how to actually measure success on some of these campaigns. You know, I know the State Department uses some of the services that are out there to actually measure campaigns' effectiveness, but it's, it's really not that easy to figure out how do you counter, you know, these campaigns from Putin. How do you actually bring him down or bring his government down or influence geopolitics in those areas? It's not easy. So. I got two questions for you. Um, the first one is about Georgia. From the geopolitical standpoint, there's a huge swing between uh, the pro US stance, because we know that Mika Saakashvili was uh, providing weapons to uh, the rebels in the uh, South Ossetia uh, conflict. But on the other hand, it's also a very important uh, uh, breeding ground for fundamentalism. Uh, in terms of uh, ISIS commanders like uh, Abu Omar, Al Shishani. I mean, do you see Georgia as being a stable, um, let's say, area in that region? It can definitely be, you know, let's say, tilting on one side of the cyber conflict, which is all the forces it's got, or is it more on stable ground? On the other hand, when the, uh, at the election say, Mexico is closing in on a very important election next year which it seems like the punishment vote is going to go for the right way and definitely going to be leaning left. So I think it's going to be a huge round for um, electronic political warfare. What's your thought on both uh, these things? For Georgia? Yeah. Well, you know, Georgia's already fractured pretty much. Um, Russia owns two parts of Georgia already. And... I think it's going to be very difficult for Georgia to have any influence in that region. I mean, it's because Russia really wants to, to overthrow that government, and eventually they probably will. But, you know, NATO is trying to get in there, and Georgia is trying to become a NATO ally. But, in, you know, until that happens, you know, it's just going to be in a pretty much unstable place. You know, where, I mean, people get killed all the time there. You know, one of the people that go to my that went to my church was there on a mission trip and got murdered. Right? It's not stable there. And for Mexico, you know, they've had political problems in the past with the Zapatistas. Remember back a long time ago, one of the first denial services.